Yeah.
Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. And Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new, so I surrender.
thinking all week, if I had just experienced the real death, burial, and resurrection, and this was my first communion with fellow believers, when Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, what would I remember? Would I remember Jesus' glance over me, to me at the table if I was there? Would I remember the joke he told that was super funny? Would I remember how it felt to lean against him like John. What would I remember? And I can, it led me to the idea of what cup he drank out of. See, in the Passover feast, there was a total of five cups, four of which he drank out, drank out of. And in the scripture, it says that after dinner, which means they've already drank in two cups, Jesus took the cup. And Jesus takes this cup and he says, this is the blood of my covenant. As often as you do this, drink this in remembrance of me. And if you don't know, the disciples would have known. Amongst all the glances, amongst all the jokes, amongst all the, the intimate moments, they would have remembered him taking this cup and what these cups meant. Because in Exodus 6, thank you, each cup stands for something that God said he would do. This is what God says to the people of Israel during the first Passover. He says, I am the Lord, and I bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So that's the first cup. I will bring you out. The second cup is I will free you from being slaves to them. That's the second cup. And I will redeem you. And that's the third cup. When Jesus takes the third cup of the Passover meal, and he says, this is my blood. He is saying, I will redeem you. And I love what he says here in Exodus. Because remember, God is the same God, right? He says, I will redeem you with outstretched arm. Isn't that true? And with mighty acts and wonders. And the disciples didn't know in that moment, but I bet you they knew a week later when they were doing this in remembrance of him. That this cup was the cross, was his blood. So today, I was thinking a lot about that this week of what would it mean to me to do this in remembrance of Jesus? What does his blood mean to me? What does the redemption that he gave mean to me? And so I pray that today, as we take this blood, as we take this bread, that you remember God's mighty work, his outstretched arm, and his powerful acts in your life. Let's go ahead and take the bread. We take the bread remembering that Jesus broke his body for us. Let's go ahead and take it. That with outstretched hand, he redeemed us. And we take the cup. And we remember you today, Jesus. Lord, we proclaim your victory, as Paul says. We proclaim your death in our life, Lord. That redeems us. Let's take this today. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your redeeming power. Lord, for your outstretched arms on the cross, Lord Jesus. And this story in Exodus reminds me of when you brought them out, Lord, and they put the blood of the lamb over their doors at Passover. The Holy Spirit didn't look in to see who was worthy. He looked at the blood. And that's the same blood today, Lord, that we look to. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for your redemption. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your great love for us, Lord. And we honor and we remember you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All I want is to live within your love. Be undone by who my desire is to know you deeper and Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind, I am desperate for a 
Turning your Bibles to James, the third chapter, we're going to read James 3.13 through 4.10. Let me just say this about the scriptures. This is not just some book of tips or hints or nuances or something to acquiesce to. These are words written by men who were inspired by God, written in their own words, but inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write what they wrote. And this book, it is believed, may have been the first book of your New Testament written by James, the brother of Jesus, who had more time with him than anybody. He became a believer after the resurrection. He wasn't sure about his big brother until then. He was his half-brother, the son of Joseph and Mary. Yes, she wasn't always a virgin. She had at least six more children, four sons and two or more daughters. And he pastored, led the church in Jerusalem. And when the question arose, what do we do with Gentiles who are becoming believers? Do they have to become Jews, you know, be circumcised, things like that? And James had a grasp of the picture of the new covenant from his relationship with his brother, and from the scriptures. And he helped with the help of the Holy Spirit and the church leaders that Christ is our circumcision and that we do not have to become Jews to become believers. Jews who came in under the first covenant, children, descendants of Abraham, have not been replaced, but we have been grafted into them through faith. Abraham was blessed by God before he was circumcised. He had a relationship going with the Father before the Torah was written. And so we are grafted in into the faith of Abraham. And so when you read the story of the church after the resurrection, they began to meet daily. They fellowship. We're going to do that here today. They baptized new believers. They worshiped and prayed And they continued in the apostles' teaching, or the word doctrine. Doctrine is not a bad word if it's not false doctrine. So they continued in the apostles' teaching. What did the apostles teach? Well, read Acts, and you can see what they taught, interlaced within the history. But here is an apostles' teaching, James' teaching. God's word made flesh did not come to earth and speak meaningless platitudes. He spoke the word of God. He was God's word impersonated in person. And he instructed his followers to do likewise. When he ascended, go into all the world, baptize them, baptize new believers, make disciples and teach them to observe everything I commanded. So these words are to be taken seriously. Now, we can't apply all of them in our own strength. That's where we need God. We need the Holy Spirit. And so the word draws us near to him, away from our opinions and our theories and our theologies to the scripture. And so we read the scripture with that attitude. So let's read it together. I'm reading from the New King James Version, James 3.13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. We'll see in a minute that word also means humility. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic, If you've got envy and self-seeking in your heart, don't lie about it. Confess it. Come to the Lord for cleansing. Some people don't want to admit that they're self-seeking or that they have envy because they have a thousand reasons to hold grudges. They're using their intelligence to sin with. We're to submit our intelligence to the Lord. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Are all of your relationships confusing? 
could be some envy at work. But the wisdom, verse 17, that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You want to have righteous fruit in your life? Look at the seed you are sowing. Verse 1 of James 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Who loves to be comfortable? Yes, everybody does. And so when things go our way and we have control, we're pleased. That is a form of self-seeking. So when we're self-seeking, it creates conflicts. You lust, which is strong desire. It can be sexual desire. Verse two, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. Well, I've never murdered anybody, but Jesus said if you hate someone, you've got murder in your heart. And coveting is, it's, it's part of the Torah. It's the 10th commandment. It deals with the heart. And coveting is a real thing. I'm convinced it's a big problem in the world. And cannot obtain. You fight in war, always in conflict, talking bad about folks, holding grudges. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. The concerns we have, we're to ask for them from the Lord. Submit them to him in prayer because some of the things we ask for are not his will. Look at this, verse three. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasure. It's about his pleasure, not mine. Can I get an amen? Adulterers and adulteresses. Wait just a minute. This verse doesn't apply to me. I've never committed adultery. If you've given your life to the Lord, and then you continue or you start up again to pursue self-seeking ways, you're chasing another lover. It might be yourself or might be that thing you think is going to make you happy. That is spiritual adultery. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Maybe you really want something so you'll look good to your neighbors or to your family or to your kinfolks or uh, to that person you're competing with. That's friendship with the world. Verse 5. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously? Now, God is a jealous God, but he's jealous for our benefit. Our jealousy is for self. God's jealous for us because if we are unfaithful to him, it's not going to go well for us. But, verse 6, he gives more grace. Who's thankful for grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You ever feel like when you're praying, God is saying, talk to the hand? If that's true, it may be God is resisting you. A lot of our problems may not be the devil, may not be our neighbor, may not be that person you can't stand till you can't stand no more. It may be God. Talk to the hand. Get this area straight in your heart. But if we humble ourselves, he'll give us grace, the grace we need. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Some people are resisting all the time, but they're not submitting to God. So there's no authority that comes from us. Our authority comes from above. So when we submit to God, he gives us authority to resist the enemy. You see that? Submit to God first, then resist the enemy. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Can you say, get serious? This humility thing is important. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Let's pray. 
Lord, I thank you for your word. Help us to hold it dear to our hearts. Lord, I pray for those that have left. I pray, Lord, you convict them and give them a desire for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to just kind of zero in on verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct, the proof is in the pudding, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. There's something about wisdom that is meek. If you're wise, you don't have to get upset so easily. You can walk in meekness because you are walking at a higher level of living, wisdom. Wisdom will reduce our number of personal prayer requests. Wisdom will help us weather relationship storms and bring us through with reconciliation. Wisdom will help us prosper. Wisdom will help us work. Wisdom will help us have strong families. But one aspect of wisdom is meekness or humility. The Greek word used there is prautes, which in a strong, simple concordance dictionary says it's mildness, gentleness, or humility. So let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the mildness of wisdom, in the gentleness of wisdom, or as I want to zero in today, in the humility of wisdom. The complete Jewish Bible translates this verse as this part of verse 13. Let him demonstrate it by his good way of life. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him demonstrate it by his good life, by actions done and the humility that grows out of wisdom. The God's Word translation, following this question, who is wise and understanding among you, says, show this by living the right way with the humility that comes from wisdom. And the popular NIV follows this question with this translation, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Other translators translate it as gentleness. When you're wise, you just have inside information. It's like you have foresight. You don't have to get shook up all the time. You know things are going to work out if you put your trust in the Lord and do what he says. We're talking to you today on the wisdom of humility. Can we say humility? Humility, according to the InterVarsity Press New Testament commentary, is defined as the teachability, this is biblical humility, the teachability by which we are to accept humbly, with meekness, the word of God. As in James, the first chapter of this book, verse 21 reads, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So if we're humble, we will approach the word of God with respect, not the respect that keeps the dust off the family Bible on the table, but the respect that applies the contents of the word to our life. The respect that causes us to draw near to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I see what your word says. I need some help because I want to kill somebody. And your word says for me to love my enemies. The IVP New Testament commentary goes on. Humility is a submissive readiness to do what the word says with deeds done in humility. It continues, humility is a yielding of oneself in ready teachability. Can we say teachable? In ready teachability and responsiveness to God's word, resulting in a good and unselfish life of peace with other people. So what is my problem? Pride. So what is humility? It's resisting pride. That's what it is. The opposite of humility is an unwillingness to learn and a refusal to yield. Our pride will give us a stiff neck where we won't change for nobody. 
I have a friend that brags about always having to learn things the hard way and said, this is how God deals with him. And I'm like, dude, get a clue. Hello. You reap what you sow. Look at what you're planting. The wisdom of humility. Even the secular world recognizes the wisdom of humility. This came from the Forbes newsletter. Don't worry, we're going to get back to the Bible, but I just want to connect with those that aren't sure about the Bible yet. Humility enables me to be more teachable. Can we say be more teachable? Humility helps us look beyond ourselves. Can we say look beyond ourselves? When I'm prideful, I don't want to learn because I already know it all. And not realizing my perspective is limited by my experience. Limited by the mantras that I hold to when there could be a whole realm of possibilities out there if I just humble myself and become teachable. Humility teaches me to keep myself in check. We say keep myself in check. Humility helps us let go of control. You're about the old boy that woke up one morning and thanked the Lord that he hadn't cussed, he hadn't sinned, he hadn't gossiped, he hadn't slandered anybody, he hadn't sowed any discord, he hadn't punched out anybody, he hadn't stolen anything, hasn't coveted anything. And then he said, Lord, but I'm fixing to get out of bed and I'm gonna need your help today. <laughs> the biggest problem in this church is this guy, me. It's me, oh Lord, that stands in the need of prayer. No, there's not some scandal I'm afraid is going to break out. But the point is, if I don't keep myself in check, I can be real destructive with my foolishness, my pride, my arrogance. Humility helps us let go of control. Can't control everything. It frees me to let go of hurts. Humility helps us accept change. You know what the root of most hurts is? I know there's betrayal. But the root of most hurts is unmet expectation. Betrayal is, is an unmet expectation. You trusted someone, you expected someone to live a life of faithful loyalty to you, and then they stab you in the back. And now you're offended, you're hurt. That is an unmet expectation. We are supposed to, we'll learn in a few weeks, we're supposed to live as the Lord wills. Everything is God willing. We hold things with a a light grip. It makes us flexible. We, sorry, I'm going beyond the secular realm into the biblical thing, but the point is, let it go. You have an expectation that nothing will change. Everything is going to go your way. But <laughs> it doesn't always go our way. That's not reality. So wisdom teaches us to be humble, change happens. We make adjustments. Change can disappoint us. Change can, maybe you invested all your uh, investments in steam shipping, you know, steamships. And then lo, lo and behold, here comes internal combustion engines and wasted all your investment. That's life. Let it go. Don't let it ruin the rest of your life. I had a friend that um, was a widower. And he was a caretaker for his wife for seven long years. He was faithful. He stood up to the task. He met the challenge. A hero. Lives in East Texas now. Now he's single. And after about a year, he decides... He's in his 70s. I deserve to be married. Entitlement, watch out. And he was about to marry a woman, a sweet lady that had grandchildren from hell, and I'm not lying. <laughs> so another brother, we're both younger than him, another brother, a married brother, and I had lunch with him at Wendy's. And we approached him with our concerns. And his response was, I have suffered enough. 
So I deserve to be happy. I have a right to this woman. And I said, we said, yes, brother, you have suffered enough. It's terrible. But suffering doesn't give you the right to ruin the rest of your life. We got through to him. He let her go. And the Lord brought someone along that he knew from college who um, was a widow, widow and she didn't happen, didn't happen to have any children. And so there was no grandchildren from hell. And they were happily married. The problem was she was a front row Baptist. Yes, in her 70s, she was devout, a new believer, sat on the front row over here at Acton Baptist. Well, he had been a Baptist preacher and got hurt and left that denomination. So he, he was almost a deal breaker for him. And I said, brother, this is a good woman, right? Yes, she is. She's, I think she's the one for me, yeah. But I don't want to go. She's front row Baptist. She's very devoted. I says, could it be that God's going to use her to heal your heart towards the Baptist? The people at Acton Baptist didn't hurt you. The people that hurt you were, they're, they're long gone, right? The unmet expectations happened years ago. Let it go. And so they got married and made an agreement. They would come here once every six weeks. They did that a few times. Then it was once every three months. And then once every six months, and then he was fitting in, enjoying life at Acton Baptist. Isn't that awesome? He needed wisdom from some younger brothers, and younger brothers, we need wisdom from older brothers, right? So the change in his life, he had to accept, but he had to resist this entitlement thing because it would have led him down a path of heartache. Humility empowers us to be more vulnerable, to be vulnerable. Can you say vulnerable? Vulnerable. Humility helps us face fear. What is vulnerability? It's honesty. It's a pure approach to life where you're not hiding behind a fake persona or a mask. It, it protects us. Vulnerability helps clear the hypocrisy away. It frees us to say, I was wrong and you were right. And it helps us face fear. Pride makes us so vulnerable to fear where humility frees us from the freedom of fear. So humility encourages us to be more teachable, to look beyond ourselves, to keep ourselves in check, to let go of control, let go of hurts, to accept change, to be vulnerable, and to face fear. All right, so that's good advice, but this is not a pep talk. This is not a sermonette for Christianettes who worship their red Corvettes and won't let go of their TV sets. All right, I'll stop. The wisdom of humility. Now, what is the biblical wisdom of humility? Can you say the word blessing? blessing. Oh, my goodness. It brings such blessing. It may look like the opposite, but it's the seed of God's blessing in our life. God saves the humble who believes salvation is wonderful. Salvation applies to Everything, not just your eternal soul, but it applies to God dealing in your life, bringing wholeness. Psalm 18, 27, we're going to go through some other scriptures other than James. It says to the Lord, you will save the humble people. You, maybe you're being humbled. It's nice to be able to humble yourself. It's hard to be humiliated. Maybe you're being afflicted. But this promise is for both kinds, I believe. And it's it comes from 2 Samuel 22. The Lord, you will save the humble people. The humble can have wisdom. When pride comes, Proverbs 11:2, 2, then comes shame. But with the humble, or is it humble? I'm going to say humble because it's humility, not, not humility, right? What messed with me is we lived in humble, Texas. Our daughter was born there. The Lord blesses the humble. Can we say blessing? blessing? Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. I'm being dishonored. I'm not living my best life. I'm tired of being broke. Embrace humility and have strong respect 
for the Lord to the point it can be explained as fear. It's an awesome respect. Blessing will come. Humility will make you teachable so you'll learn how to prosper in the things you're struggling with. The humble will be honored. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. You may be going through a season of slander on your job or with your kinfolk, and you know they're lying, and some of them know they're lying, and it hurts if you hold on to pride. It hurts. But if you stay humble, God will vindicate you. He will heal you, and he will repair the damages that you're dealing with. But you gotta trust him. Yeah, but it's been years. Well, he's not done. He's not done. God revives the humble. Can we say revival? Who wants revival? I want revival. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and lowly one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. And here's what he says. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Humility. The Lord sees. He knows. There's three sides to every story. There's your side, there's your adversary's side, and then there's God's side. So humble ourselves in his sight and say, Lord, bring peace. Show me what to do and what not to do. Sometimes what we don't do is more important. The Lord observes the humble. Isaiah 66, 2. The Lord says through this prophet, for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one, I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Tell someone humble. God looks. He resists the proud, but blesses the humble. I believe the Apostle Paul had a handle on this, this concept. He knew that pride was wrong. It caused him to be unteachable, persecuting Christians, and the Lord humbled him by removing his sight for three days, humbled him by showing him the scriptures through news, new eyes without all those preconceived notions he had. And the older he got, the more he had to be proud of. He had quite a pedigree. He didn't have more degrees than a thermometer, but he came close. Yet the older he got, the more humility he had. This sermon is not just for the young folks. It's for us all because the older we get, the more victories we've accumulated and accomplished, the more humility we need because of that. So in Paul's writings in three or four places, you can see this sequence if you'll find out the time that he wrote it. In the early part of his ministry, he referred to himself in one place as the least of the apostles. Later on in one of his writings, he referred to himself as the least of the saints. What are saints? They're the set-apart ones, the members of the church, the apostles of the leaders. He was a church planter, one sent out. So he's the least of the apostles. He had these, you know, 11 apostles, including James 12 and others that the Lord had raised up, church planters, going where no man has gone before to establish bases for the kingdom. He considered himself, made himself consider himself, graded himself as the least of those awesome men of God. And then as he continues, he considers himself the least of the saints. That's the body of Christ as a whole. We're all called to be saints, aren't we? Sometimes we feel like we're ain'ts, but we're called to be saints. I'm the least of the saints. Toward the end of his life, He called himself the chiefest of sinners. What? What is he doing? He's resisting pride. 
He doesn't know, at least I don't think he knew his books would be compiled and, you know, form like half the New Testament. But all that knowledge didn't puff him up. He kept humbling himself. So what is humility? It's the battle against pride. You wake up every day. If you want to be a humble person, you know, if you wrote a book called Humility and I Attained It, and as soon as it came out, you lost it. So it's a battle against our pride. The Lord hears the humble, Daniel 10, 12. Then he, the angel who visited Daniel after he'd been praying for something for weeks. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your mind and heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come as a result of your words. How long was he, how long did he pray? Let's Bible trivia here today. How long, how long did Daniel pray before the angel appeared? 21 days? Three weeks, yes. All right. Where were you on Bible Trivia Day last Saturday? I was invited to be part of a pastor's Bible Trivia contest. And out of the 14 people that had the courage to sign up, only three of us were senior pastors. My peers are a bunch of chickens. (laughs) The guy that won was an 80-something-year-old Church of Christ preacher from a church 45 miles away. So they had to reach out a long ways, right? He was incredible. He hit the button before the questions were over. (laughs) The guy that came in second place wasn't a senior pastor. I came in fourth. Not even an honorable mention. So wait till I see my buddies. Guys, where were you? (laughs) Well, pastor, why didn't you announce it? Well, obviously. (laughs) I still have pride to deal with. (laughs) God gives grace to the humble. James 3, 6. We read this. God resists the proud but gives grace. Can we say grace? Grace. It's his undeserved favor. It's his empowering mercy that he gives to us when we humble ourselves. You may be going through something that's really hard to take. You need grace. God is able. I'm not having any grace. Run to him and humble yourself. Say, Lord, you know, where have I done wrong in this situation? Show me. Stop hiding behind the faults of others and just look in the mirror. That's our greatest enemy. The Lord lifts up the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. That was our final verse today. In the 70s, the Maranatha singers recorded this verse in King James English, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And it was one of these repetition songs I just want to try it. So I'll sing it to you, and then I'll teach the repeat, all right? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. All right, here we go. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. I am the vine and you are the branches. I am the vine and you are the branches. And you will bear much fruit, more abundant. And you will bear much fruit. Thank you for that. A lot of people get 
their theology from songs. That's why it's important that our songs are biblical. If your songs could be sung to your boyfriend and girlfriend and be real, song's not biblical enough. That's why the name of Jesus is important. And the gospel is important. Because when those things are included, you can't just sing that to just anybody. Amen? All right. Finally, God exalts the humble. Humble yourselves, verse 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. You see that hand? So that at the proper time, at the proper time, he may exalt you. The wisdom of humility. Watch this. You. You are just one person. You're just one of the many people here. All of us here are just a small part of the 6.8 billion people on this earth. Our actions reveal that each individual believes that the universe revolves around them. It does not. If it did, there would have to be multiple universes. There are not. You're one person on one planet, in one solar system, in one galaxy, amongst millions of other galaxies, that constitute the actual universe that most certainly doesn't revolve around you. He. He created all this out of nothing. He shaped it all down to the tiniest detail. He formed us, all of us. He made you, and he is far greater than you. But he has come here to meet with you. He has come to you. He formed you, he knows you, he hears you, he loves you. How do you feel about him? It is time. It is time to tell him. He is the one we've come for. He is the one to whom we pray. He is the one to whom we cry. He is the one to whom we listen. He is the one we long to know. He is the one we love. He is the one we worship. It's time. I long to be humble, or is it humble? But often I grumble, sometimes stumble because of selfish pride. I am tempted to mumble. Sometimes I tumble with mind all a jumble, causing me to fumble missed opportunities to shine. Wanting to rumble with what makes me bumble, needing conforming to Christ, making you know who tremble, abundantly living this life. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would embrace your word with meekness, with humility and that we would want to be like Jesus. Help us, Lord, to resist pride and to recognize 
We're not all that in a box of crackers. Yet you love us. Oh God, that's so humbling that you would love us. That you would love me, that you would care for me. Let's focus on his greatness. Not on ourselves. And he will lift you up. Let's worship.